All right, so then, do we have a question? Yes, sir. Um, let's see. So I, I have a suspicion in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. All right. Um, the identity of the branch. Okay. I mm -hmm. think, I'm pretty sure it's Jesus Christ, but I don't mm -hmm. know any other cross-references to actually prove that. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, so then, Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8. So this has been a question uh, uh, amongst people, if that is Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of preachers will say it is Jesus, actually. A lot of preachers will say that it is Jesus. All right, so we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Notice here now, oh, notice who he calls him. Joshua, right? The high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Okay, so notice right here that he is known to be as the branch. Now, when you look up that word about the branch right there, What's very interesting is that it's in line with the tree. But Jesus Christ, he's known as the root, right, of Jesse. So there's a relationship right here. So this branch is known to be as Joshua. This one we know is Jesus. Okay, point number one, why we can see the similarity is because of this. Concerning a tree right here the branch and the root. Another thing is this. Another thing is notice that he's called Joshua, right? So if you look at the second point right here, he's known to be as Joshua. Now I want you to go to Acts chapter 7, please. Acts chapter 7. Now Joshua, you gotta understand, is a Hebrew word. Hebrew to English. Jesus, where that word is, it goes from Hebrew to Greek to English. And this one actually comes from Joshua. Now look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Notice that the word of God shows right here. Now remember, who's the one that brought the children of Israel to the promised land? His name is Joshua, right? Now look what the book of Acts calls him, though. Go to Acts chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 45, verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with who? Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the faith of, face of our fathers, unto the day of David. That's Joshua conquest of the promised land. Now look at verse 44. Notice he's going by sequence here. The children of Israel in the wilderness with Moses. The next part of the story, verse 45, the Jews enter the promised land under Joshua. But notice that the New Testament, it calls him Jesus. Why is that? Because there's similarity right here. See, there's a similarity right here. So that's a real big evidence right there that you can use for Zechariah chapter 3 that it would be referring to Jesus. But here's another thing right here. Well, you could probably argue this would be a very good verse for Jews. Now think about that. You can prove right here that this person is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in your Old Testament. You could probably point that out to a Jew that, the, that in your Old Testament it does mention about Jesus and how God sees him as something sacred. But let's read the whole context here, and you can tell that this really pictures Jesus Christ. We're going to look at verse 8. Here, uh, Zechariah 3, 8 again. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes, 
Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land one day. So notice right here that Joshua is likened, connected to a stone, and that there are seven eyes. And not only that, it's based on this Joshua that God removes the iniquity of the children of Israel. Now, if you read your Bible, Messiah must be present to the Jews where he can take away their sins and their iniquities. So let's look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. While, we're, while I'm explaining to you, uh, develop a question in the meantime, all right? Develop a question in the meantime. All right, Daniel chapter 9. And then we're going to look at verse 24, 24. Now notice that God said that the nation of Israel, he's going to take away the iniquity from their nation. But he puts a timeline. He calls it 70 weeks. Look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to what? Finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Okay, the Messiah is necessary to fulfill this because look at verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, so notice right here that part of the 70 weeks is, cut, uh, is finished right here. Shall Messiah, notice, be what? Cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the princess shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Not only that, look at verse 25. Know, know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto what? Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So notice right here that verse 25 and 26, it mentions right here that in the 70 weeks, God's going to uh, finally wipe away the sins of the nation of Israel. 69 weeks of the 70 weeks is when Jesus the Messiah comes. The last week is going to be the tribulation week, which you can look at verse 27. Verse 27 is the famous verse and the only verse in the entire Bible that talks about the seven-year tribulation because of that one week, seven days. One day equals one year. So that's the idea. But anyway, that's besides the point. The point is, notice that Messiah, based on Messiah, the sins of the nation of Israel is wiped away, right? Remember Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 through 10? Based on Joshua... Can the iniquity of the children of Israel be wiped away? So, that's the third reason why this Joshua is going to be Jesus Christ. It's because it's based on the fact that the iniquity of Israel is wiped away. No, oh, yikes. Okay. When is it wiped away? It has to be wiped away. By the Messiah, when the Messiah is there, Jesus. All right, here's the fourth reason. The fourth reason why is because, remember it mentions about the stone right there? All right, look at the book of 1 Peter, please. The book of 1 Peter. What is Jesus Christ known as? The chief cornerstone. That's what he's known as. So we're going to look at the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, please. 1 Peter, chapter 2. Notice that Jesus Christ, he is likened to the stone. And remember, Zechariah 3, verses 8 through 10, it talks about Joshua connected to what? The stone. Notice right here, verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So notice that this is speaking about Jesus Christ, uh, look at verse 5, the last part. Acceptable to God by who? Jesus Christ. And talking about Jesus Christ, verse 6, the chief cornerstone. So notice right here that this is another connection why Zechariah 3, 8 through 10, Joshua the high priest will be connected to Jesus. But another thing is this. Notice that this stone has seven eyes, right? As Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Jesus is also known to be as the lamb that was slain who has seven eyes. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. 
Verse 6, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. So that's the fifth reason. The fifth reason why is because of the seven eyes. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So that's Jesus, right? But look what it says. Having seven horns and seven what? Eyes. That matches with Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Joshua connected to a stone, and this stone has seven eyes. The last thing I want to say about Joshua, which is probably the main reason, this is the most popular reason why a lot of preachers like to use this to connect, as a connection with Jesus. It's because Joshua is known as to be the high priest who makes reconciliation for the people. Now, let me ask you this question. Who's the high priest that reconciles on our behalf? It's Jesus Christ, right? That's based, uh, we're not going to turn to those verses for time's sake, but that's based off of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as well as Romans chapter 8, as well as Hebrews chapter, I'm going by memory, 4. All right. All right, so that's my answer to all of this from the top of my head, okay? Okay.